Hello, everybody. This is Sunita Tandashekun from the Department of Computer Information Sciences at the University of Delaware. Welcome to the virtual College Build workshop. Um, first up, I hope you and your family and friends are doing safe and healthy. Um, this workshop, as you know, is about the scientific software developer productivity. And I'm going to bring up some case studies that we have been working on in my group. Uh, with collaborators, and um, I'm going to look into some of the challenges, some of the opportunities that these challenges provide, and uh, some of the potential solutions we have come up with in order to address um, these challenges. So mm -hmm. I broke down the um, topics for us to ponder about into four different categories, um, software migration, benchmarking effort, data analytics, and machine learning pipelines, and RSC. So what does RSC really stand for? Research Software Engineers. And I, I left the acronym in there because I believe by now we all must be aware of who is an RSC and what is, a, uh, what is an RSC. And we will see a little bit about that. So let's dig, in, dig into you know, some of these topics, one of them being software migration. And when I say software migration, what comes immediately to mind? is, ah, so how are we moving software from one system to the other? Um, so is it a sophisticated term for software rewriting, um, which I believe it is, which is why I put that in the bracket with a question mark. Um, and you have system A and you have system B and you have written software for system A, so how do you really move it to you know, another system without creating a whole different software from scratch, right? And um, I wanted to talk about this with respect to a particular project ongoing in my group since last fall. And this is uh, one of the prestigious projects going on, which is a car project in collaboration with Oak Ridge National Lab. Um, this is in collaboration with Ronnie Chatterjee at Oak Ridge, um, Michael Busman, Alex Debut, Thomas Klu, uh, Rene Vadera, Sergey Bastrokov, Peter Yukland from ACDR, Jeff Young from Georgia Tech, and um, Matt Leinhauser, who's my PhD student, has been working on this project since last year. So the idea of this project is, um, you know, um, it's Picon GPU. Picon GPU is part of the Lin cell. Um, it's a plasma physics code. The code has run on Titan, first 2013 Gordon Bell finalist. The code ran on Summit just last fall when we ran a full summit compilation and execution to get the form runs done, the viewer of merit. And now we are preparing the code for the upcoming Exascale system Frontier. Now we know that Frontier is a very different beast compared to Titan and Summit. Frontier is a Cray AMD system and the CPUs and GPUs, you know, are different to what we have dealt with till date. Um, or at least especially with respect to Summit, right? So with respect to that, many questions come to mind. Um, how are we going to prepare the software? What is the migration process going to look like? How time consuming it is going to be, uh, or it's going to be? Are the software even ready to tackle frontier kind of a system, right? So to that end, this particular project or Picon GPU is written using Alpaca, which is a C++ software abstraction. Um, which is, this is a project which um, is heavily, uh, you know, done by ACDR. They have been working on Alpaca for several years now. And the Pico and GPU plus Alpaca together are approximately about 100,000 um, lines of code. And um, the Alpaca can target different hardware platforms, as you can see, NVIDIA GPU, AMD, um, and, you know, ARM processors, traditional CPU architectures, etc. And the different backends Alpaca uh, can target is um, they, they include CUDA, KIP, um, OpenMP offloading, OpenMP 3.0, OpenACC, Sickle as well. So, you know, I tend to call Alpaca as an umbrella with the different backends as a spoke. Uh, so, several spokes of Alpaca which can target different systems. You know, the goal being how to um, achieve performance without losing portability and how to create a maintainable code, right? And uh, how do you move Picon GPU across different architectures without somebody needing to write things from scratch? Um, and in, in that process, and I would say that the number of opportunities or the bullets listed in this slide does not just um, um, you know, it's, it's not just for Picon GPU and car project, right? It's broadly 
applicable for any project that you have to move from one system to the other. The very first bullet talks about um, mini test codes. By that, I mean that every time you have a new compiler, you have a new compiler version, you don't want to be testing 100,000 lines of code. You want to be testing mini test codes. You want to be um, you know, having the code under control so that you know where the code is failing um, and to be able to backtrack and you'll be able to reproduce the bugs and so on. So to that end, we use several Alpaca mini test codes to stress test the you know, compilers and hardware architectures. And uh, something else that is another important piece is using profilers. We have used you know, NVIDIA, NVProf, and site type of profilers for Titan Summit uh, come Frontier, we have to look into the kind of profilers that will work with Frontier architecture, run the code by the profiler to see the hot spots and you know, reprofile them after you apply optimizations and stuff because profilers can tell you so much about the code. And uh, with Frontier, we want to express and you know, explore parallelism on many different levels, be it at the application level, be it at the software level, be it at the hardware level because all together is a package, right? So you want to be able to um, exploit um, and explore and express parallelism in many different levels. While doing all this, something else that I wanted to, um, wanted all of us to keep in mind that the goal should be to develop synergies between different programming model communities. Because if we were to reinvent the wheel every time a new system is going to be in place, then you're going to have an abundance amount of you know, software and you're not going to know which ones to use. You in the sense where I, I predominantly mean domain scientists, we are practically burdening them with too many different options and with a little CS background, they're not going to know which ones to pick. So the problem begins there. So building synergies between communities is vital. Um, with respect to pick on GPU, we are leveraging ATDR's Alpaca knowledge, my group's OpenMP offloading validation verification test suite, it's an ECP ongoing project. Um, so we are you know, trying to get best of both worlds and putting our heads together to you know, build this um, um, software abstraction for Pico GPU and Frontier. And that process had led us to create HIP background, OpenMP offloading backgrounds. We have also uh, developed a ticket, uh, created a ticket to um, ask for a new feature with an OpenACC specification. We have been working with the Center of Excellence, Cray and AMD to report several bugs. And we've also been reporting bugs to the other vendors as well as you can see. And every time you know, the vendor closes a bug, fixes a bug, we'll have to go back and check and test right, if the, if the new compiler release is actually doing the job that it's supposed to. So um, some rule of thumb, author of PR pull request cannot merge his or her own um, PR, right? So rule of thumb, then we have to report bugs we have to report bugs. There is no two way about it. My students tend to create workarounds and they are happy with what they have done and they move on. But imagine the bug was not fixed. Somebody else to create, somebody else will create the same workaround. Another person will create the same workaround. So you're basically not fixing the problem. You're going around it. So you want to report the bugs and workarounds are good because the vendor is going to ask you for a case study, right? So you want to build a small case study to hand off to the vendor for them to nail down where the bug is coming from, but you want to report the bug and you want to report the bug via ticket system. Please don't email bug reports. Um, that's not going to go anywhere. So you want to record these bugs, you know, using conventional trackers. And uh, with respect to car, sometimes we typically, you know, communicate to the developers directly because we have a timeline, we have a deadline, and we want to make sure that the code works by that um, timeline. I'm switching topics a little bit here, not too much, but um, this is going to focus on the need for um, robust compiler tool sets and debugger tool sets, any software tool sets, and how we can push boundaries of software and hardware stacks with um, respect to you know, um, giving a very robust and mature and stable uh, tool set to scientific developers. And to that aspect, one of the um, ongoing efforts and through the work in collaboration with the SPEC HPG High Performance Group Organization, where we are um, building a benchmark suite that comprises of several different applications spanning many domains, because the idea is to grab as much as different physics as possible, um, because different types of code from different domains are going to push the boundaries of hardware and software in different aspects. So that's what you want when you are testing a large scale system or a supercomputer, if you like. 
And to that end, you want different workloads. You don't want to always work with a small workload. You want small, medium, large workloads. You want weak scaling applications. You want strong scaling applications. And not to forget, you don't want to lose accuracy while you're pushing boundaries, right? So sometimes we ask the scientific developer to give us a validation test. Sometimes a spec harness itself has mechanisms in place to check for validity of the code uh, porting. And uh, we also want to look into performance modeling, either as a spec HPD organization or you know, working with different scientific developers of the different codes we got, because that can draw insights into hardware and its impact on applications. So all this is with the goal to improve scientific uh, software productivity, because by doing this, we are um, pushing boundaries and we are trying to create a stable, mature um, software stack for any upcoming you know, hardware systems. And there are several members within Spec HPD and all of us just testing in our own in-house platforms is going to give you a plethora of results to look into and see what failed where and how and when and you know, report them back to the vendors to make sure that the bugs are fixed, you know, and um, um, and you retest them basically. So this is the other important if, um, um, aspect of uh, productive software. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit from HPC to data analytics and machine learning. And what drove me to talk about this is an ongoing project in my group for the past couple of years, and this is a project with Nemours, Dupont, Alfred Eye Hospital for Children. Um, we work with pediatric oncology data set and sickle cell disease data set. And the goal of the project is analysis of real data set and build a machine learning pipeline um, from you know, one end to the other end, enough to give the doctors white coats useful information about the real data set in a way that they can make an informed decision that this subject, aka patient, is going to walk through the door with a lung failure in six months. So how do we make sure that doesn't happen, right? So why is this project important? Because we are not dealing with data sets in tribal.com. We are not dealing with um, synthetic data sets. It is real data set and real data set is a pain to work with. To that end, I wanted to you know, put forth some challenges, which includes um, cleaning up the data set. And here we are talking about the skewed, heterogeneous, disproportionate, complex, um, and a small data set. Because real data set, it takes a while before you can build a large voluminous data set. Why? Because NGS instruments, while the sequencing technology has improved quite a bit, there is a process um, or from the you know, output of the NGS technology to preparing the de-identified data, which comes to people like us who are the data analysts. So you know, again, there's not a click of a button. So typically real data sets are small. It takes a while to become, make it large and small data sets are a pain for machine learning because machine learning learns from a large data set before it can build a model, right? So those are the obvious challenges. So what we have observed that traditional machine learning pipelines like TPOC, for example, does not really work with real data set. Um, it gives us you know, uh, absurd ROC curves and we go back to the drawing board. So we need mechanisms, you know, we need some productive solutions, productive pipelines that, can, that has bombarded these real data sets that has created um, you know, a cluster of different types of cleaning, pre-processing, feature selection techniques, classification techniques that can work with certain types of real data sets. Again, we cannot say that this pipeline will work for any real data set because when you are looking at a patient data set, every individual is different, right? So you're going to have different types of real data set. But at the least, you can prepare some sort of pipelines for certain types of um, disease data sets that you would get from the hospitals. And to the best of my knowledge, I don't think there is one such end-to-end -end pipeline that exists today. And that is slowing down the progress we can make with these real science you know, um, data set because we don't have a productive pipeline today. So this is another problem I'm throwing on the table. And I do want to mention that NGS technologies are improving as we speak. So the real data set will grow. And at some point in one chunk, we are going to have such a large amount of data set that we cannot handle. So what do we do then, right? So, um, and I also wanted to mention that data set can get complex when you are, um, when you are combining omics, which is genomics, proteomics, what have you, plus electronic health record data. So when you combine them, 
the, the data set is even more complex, even more challenging. Um, and the last but not the least, I do want to say a little bit about RSC and I won't be doing justice no matter how much I say it because um, this is a very important topic. And the reason I wanted to include this as part of the deck, my slide deck is to put it out there that we need research software engineers. We need those developers who can make um, you know, productive software, who can create sustainable reproducible software in order to call a research success. So this kind of you know, productive software is part of research methods. And uh, for, for people like me to, to push within academia the need for RSCs, I need the force to be driven from labs and industries. You know, the, the more the demand for next generation workforce and RSCs, the, the, the academia is going to prepare programs, right? That they're going to cultivate and nurture these next generation workforce. Um, and these are people who could be postdocs, could be research scientists, who could be faculty, but their end goal is to be able to, you know, create research software, right? So they, I can't even say they belong to a particular category. They are their own category, I should say, because there's a ton of work in this particular space. Um, and RSC as an essential core competence among um, young scientists and the two logos that we have is the one from UK organization and the other one is the US RSC. Anyhow, so I should stop here. This is my last slide, and um, that's my um, computational research programming lab group in action, and leaving some best practices on the on the on the screen. Um, and hope I hope you know um, you were able to take some um, good takeaways from this presentation. Feel free to drop me an email with any other ideas and thoughts you may have. Um, but yes, we need productive scientific software. So that's the bottom line. Thank you for listening and you take care.